verses 10 through 18 this morning. It's a very familiar portion of Scripture for all of us. I'm, I'm pretty sure if any of you have been saved for more than a weekend, this, this usually is a piece of Scripture that everybody knows and everybody's at least read through and studies and gets excited about. And I, I do as well. This is quite possibly one of my favorite parts of Scripture, which actually, church, what are my favorite parts of Scripture? All of it, yeah, because I could stand up every week and tell you this is my favorite part of Scripture. Jesus wept. Favorite part of Scripture. There's so much there. There's so much here in this passage as well. So we're going to go through this over a period of a few weeks because there's just so much here, and there's so much that God's been downloading into me about this passage. So don't show hands this morning, but how many of us have had a struggle in life? Okay, I know I've brought this up several times. There are several of us that, that I know in this body that have struggles. And, and the list goes on of what those struggles are. See, sometimes these struggles, though, they, they come from all kinds of places. Okay, sometimes these struggles come from us. Sometimes they come from other people. Sometimes they come from other situations. Sometimes we give way too much credit to the devil himself that it's his reason and it's his doing of, of why we have problems. See, sometimes it is him messing with us, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's our own stupidity that puts us in the situations that we're in. So today we're going to start this, this series, and I've entitled this series, Dress to Withstand. But let's drop down into our passage, and, and I will finish that thought as we, as we continue this morning. So in verse 10, book of Ephesians, chapter 5, reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day, in the evil day. Not just a day, the evil day. Aren't most of our days evil days when you sit right down and think about it? You watch the news, isn't it pretty much every day an evil day? And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the counsel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, with which is the word of God." Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keeping alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Father God, just as that word ends this morning as we pray for all the saints, Lord, we pray this morning for the saints in this building, Lord, that these saints this morning will be built up, further equipped, ready to take charge in the, in the battles that lay ahead. Lord, as we chase after you, I ask this morning that, that you would help our hearts to become even more in tune, more in line to you, that we continue to hear from your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we continue to seek after you first in all things, in all aspects of our life. Lord, I ask this morning, once again, you completely remove me from this message, Lord, that it's you and your words that are spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, with this passage, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm a guy. How many guys in this room, when you read that passage of the armor of God, you look at all those pieces of the armor of God and you think to yourself, wow, I want to be a knight of the round table. I want to grab my sword and my helmet, my chain mail, the whole nine yards, and go out back and have a sword fight. Anybody? Okay, it's just a couple of us. I know the rest of you probably want to do something else fun involving guns or something, which, yeah, I'm with that too. So, so anyway, these, these analogies in Scripture, these, these parables, these analogies as far as how this relates to that, they, I love them. I love these so much. When I, was, when I was actually first saved, I did one of these on my own. I was, I was bored at work, and I had a break, and I'm reading through Scripture and studying stuff out, and, and I drew out a... 
it's going to sound kind of nerdy, but I, I actually drew out the X's and O's that you would have for football. And, and I labeled where the apostles would be, the pastors, the preachers, the whole nine yards all the way down through the saints. And, you know, Jesus is, is there as quarterback because I thought that would be a good spot for him. And the coach, of, cor of course, is the Godhead being the coach, the all-knowing, all-seeing. So on offense, hey, we got the play perfect. On defense, we know everything that they're going to do on offense. It was great. I laid it all out. And, and I did this in a way that I was actually – Months later, I didn't know it, but months later, it was something that I was able to, to share with somebody else and kind of laid out to them what Christ meant and what he did in life through a football analogy. See, this is one of the things that, that as Christians, we're all supposed to be doing as well, you know, developing ways to talk to and communicate to people around us. Because, because ultimately, how many people are churched in our culture today? I mean, as soon as you hit the age of, I'm going to say, 40 and younger, there's, there's a lot of scripture you can mention to people, and they don't have a clue. Okay, I mean, you start talking Noah's Ark to a, a teenager who's not in a Christian family or doesn't have a Christian in their family, you start talking Noah's Ark, it falls apart. They have no clue. They think of Joan of Arc, and they, they think of all this other crazy stuff and with, without even realizing they have no clue what's going on. And that's where we come in as Christians. We can take a story, we can see something, we can relate it to Christ, and we can explain to them why Jesus is so important, why you need him in your life. Today, now, not tomorrow, today, right now. So we're starting this series called Dress to Withstand. In verse 13 we read, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, not just part of it, not a piece of it, all of it, that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. That phrase, evil day, that phrase evil day probably doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. For, for most of us, we're going to look at that word evil day, that little phrase, and we're going to say, you know what, the evil day, that's the, the day of judgment. That's the final day. That's the day Satan gets cast in. That's an evil day for him. We've got evil days leading up to that through the tribulation as well. A lot of people look at the evil day as, as that time frame. But... How many of us have had evil days? I mean, each one of us. How about this? Is an evil day. The phone rings. Somebody from your family is in the hospital and they're dying. Is that an evil day? You get called to HR. You get into human resources. You sit down and through a short conversation, you find out at the end of that conversation, you have no job. You've been fired. You've been let go. You've been whatever they sugarcoat it with, the PC words. You come home to find out that your house is on fire. I mean, there was a fire in Canastota from one of our church members' houses, not their house, but down the road. And let me tell you something. I was driving by that. It was Juliana's birthday. I was driving by. I looked down the road, and when I saw there were fire trucks on that road near the member of our church house, I drove past the end of that road three or four times until I could figure out it wasn't their home. And I, I told Juliana as soon as I first saw that, hey, guess what? This is an evil day. If their house is on fire, your birthday is canceled. We will reschedule. Because, you know, that's a life-changing moment. That's a pastor needs to be there kind of moment. How's this one for an evil, evil day? You get news from the mechanic that you had a tire that had been ruined on your vehicle. You get a phone call the day after you drop it off, and they, they were supposed to get tires in. And then they tell you, hey, you know what, it's going to be another three days before your tires get here because, oops, the order didn't get placed. And then the day they, they go to do the work, and then they call you and they tell you, hey, by the way, we found some other stuff on your vehicle that needs to be repaired, and it's going to be an expensive bill. Is that an evil day? Yes. Absolutely. How about you've been to the doctor's office? You get into the doctor's office, you sit down, and you've been waiting for test results, and the doctor gives you the test results of, hey, sorry to tell you this, but you need to start making end-of-life plans. Is that an evil day? Or you've got cancer. Is that an evil day? Evil days. How about you fall back into a sin habit that you once had? Is that an evil day? Absolutely. Now, 
Take a few moments and think of some of the evil days that you've experienced in your life. Think about some of the evil days you think are coming in your life. As Christians, when those evil days come, see the time between those evil days, you know what that is? That's a time when you spend rebuilding, getting your armor back into shape. You know, because I, I'm sorry, you take a hit with some armor right here, is that armor going to dent? Absolutely. You know what, though? You take some time with the Lord, and you know what? He's going to help you pound that back out, put it back into alignment, so that this way when the next attack comes, you're going to be able to withstand that sucker. You'll take the blow, and you'll be able to say, hey, you know what? My armor's not even chinked at this time. Nice try. See, see, it's important that we look at each piece of the armor as well as we go through and realize that they have a specific purpose for our life. But not only that, they provide a total covering as a Christian. As you look at the armor, everything is covered from top of head to bottom of feet. Nothing is missing. Every single part of your body is completely engulfed and encrusted in what Christ has. So as we put on the armor and we join the battle, there are a few things that we must have right. Number one, number one, we must battle under the right leadership. Under the right leadership. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There's, there's a couple other ways we can read that as well. We, we can read it as, Finally, be strengthened in the Lord. Or be enabled in the Lord. Be enabled in the Lord. Being enabled means you can do something, right? It's, it's not a casting aside. It's not somebody else's responsibility. When you're enabled, you're given the power to do something. See, there's, there's no one else in the universe that can build you up like the Lord. There's nobody else who can put you in the right place at the right time to do the right will, which would be God's will, other than God. Nobody else can do that. There's no one else that can tell you exactly what you need to hear in a moment. Following the right leader is extremely important, am I right? Yeah, definitely. So sometimes as a leader, not what you expect. Have you ever had a leader in your life that's not exactly what you would expect to be the leader in the moment? Absolutely. And if you, if you want a good example of that, write down in your notes, Book of Judges. Read the Book of Judges. Do it this afternoon. It'll only take you an hour. Not even. It's, it's, it's a decent book. It's a good book. But there's seven main judges in the book. And as you look and you study those seven main judges, each one of them has a purpose and has a calling from God to fulfill what God has. But were all of them following God? No. Samson, as an example, was all about himself. He was about self-gain. He wasn't about what God wanted. You don't even see him pray but one time. And the one time he's praying, it's for his own will, not for God's will. And God still honored that and gave him what his, his prayer request was. They were called for a time and for a season to accomplish something God wanted them to accomplish. So when we are under the Lord as our ultimate leader, though, we're strengthened. We're equipped. We have what we need to push forward. Now, as a member of the new covenant, the new family of God, our truest strength and leadership for the war in this life is Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. That's the most important thing. If we look for our strength in ourselves, what happens? We fall short. We fail. We don't make it. We can also look for strength in spirituality. Spirituality we obtained, education, influence, position, prestige, pride, money, programs, personal rights, or others we have put in place of leadership that are wrong leaders. When we do that, we fail. We fall short. We don't measure up to where Christ needs us to be. Jesus would rather that we were hot or cold rather than lukewarm. Okay? <clears throat> Hot or cold rather than lukewarm. See, when you take either type of water, you take boiling hot water and you set it on your counter, 
or you take water that you just got out of the freezer, which would be called ice, and you set it on the counter. What happens to both of those over time? Don't they eventually become lukewarm? They become lukewarm, and they're disgusting to drink. Well, I kind of like lukewarm water, but I'm, I'm weird. I'm sorry, okay? Please forgive me, but <clears throat> it's who I am. Now, why does this happen? Why does it become lukewarm? Well, let me tell you why it becomes lukewarm. Because they have lost their connection to what gave them the heat to begin with. They've lost the connection to what's given them the coldness to begin with. When you lose connection, you go from being hot and cold, you go to being lukewarm garbage and trash that Christ would rather just spit out of his mouth. See, now, now this, this analogy... This analogy comes from the letter written to the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelation. See, outside the city, they had an area, and I, I love this because it's, it sounds wonderful to me. They had an area where you could go and get in, and it was like, kind of like Yellowstone where they had the nice hot bubbling water you could get in and relax, and ah, oh, it's like the hot tub. It's very refreshing to your body. It provides a purity and a cleanness, and it does away with those muscle aches and everything else. And for some of you, the, the hot water, the gross ones of you, the hot water is wonderful. You take it and you crush some beans and you pour that hot water over the beans. And yeah, I hear the yes and all that out of some of you. I just, I can't drink coffee. Ironically, I did start drinking tea this winter. I'm happy to report. It's all right. I found it's better if you had a bigger scoop of honey. So <laughs> now, now the other thing, that, that the city did was, was they tried to pipe that water into their city. You know, the, the thought was, hey, you know what, if, if we can dig a trench or something and get the water from here to here to our city, we can have hot water in our city. But guess what? It was, it was so disconnected from the source of the heat, by the time it reached the city, it was lukewarm. Now, the, the cold water, I, I, how many of y'all love cold water? Just me. Okay, I'm the only one who drinks water, Lord. Um, so cold water is refreshing. You've got a nice hot day. You drink some cold water. Oh, it's wonderful. How many of you take a cold shower in the middle of the summer? Okay, a few of us. Awesome. Isn't that refreshing, revigorating when you jump in and you're like, wow, this is cold. And woo, temperature shock. I went from like 104 to 50. I'm wonderful now. It's great. It's very refreshing. Now, here's the other thing that Laodicea had as well. Outside of their city, they also had another area six miles away where they had cold springs, cold water springs. And these, these springs were wonderful, but you know what? They, they spent, I, how much money was wasted? They, their Build Back Better plan was awful, just like another one. And that, it was set up, and they built an aqueduct coming down into their city with the cold water. And you know what? It was... It was at the time, it was looked at as, wow, look what we have done. We're all going to have cold, refreshing water and not have to walk six miles to get to it. I mean, that sounds, I would have just moved the city. It would have been easier. But six miles trucked in. By the time it got to them, it was lukewarm. It was lukewarm and it was awful. Tasted terrible. Nasty. It's not what Jesus wants. Jesus wants us to be hot and cold. He wants us to be connected to him as the leader. So when there's a disconnect from the leader, though, there's a lukewarmness found in us. There's a lukewarmness. Luke 16, 13. Speaking of leaders as well. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. When you take two leaders, hot, cold, and you put them together, what ends up happening? Lukewarmness, so yet again. Vomited, spit out, wasted. See, our, our leadership needs to be found in one place and one place only. And that one place is to be found in Jesus Christ. That's it. Number two. Number two. So, so we started, we, we now have the right leader in Jesus. But, but here's number two. Number two, we need to have the right battle. The right battle. Verses 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against... 
key words, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. See, having the right battle is extremely important. Otherwise, we end up battling each other, and that's, and that's not where we need to be. See, it's, it's also following the right direction from the leader as well. Because if we can, we can go out there and we could be all gung-ho for something that is a Christian cause, but is that the battle that God's called me to fight? Is that the battle God's called you to fight? See, each one of us has a different battle, a different place that God's going to want us at a different time and a different place. Some of it might have to do with our history. Some of it might have to do with, with our, our ethnicity. It might have to do with other life factors. Each one of us has a different battle, a different place that we're called to be. See, sometimes we take a stand and it's not the right stand, or it's the right stand, but the timing is off. You ever had that happen where, where you know you're making the right stand, but you're saying to yourself, ah, not the right time. Not the right time. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, in this passage of Scripture, Joshua meets Jesus. The Old Testament Jesus meets the New Testament Jesus. It's another example of Jesus being the right leader and giving a right direction at the right time. Extremely important. So let's read that. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. See, Jesus' answer that he, was, that he was the commander of the Lord's army. He wasn't just an individual who was showing up. He was the commander of the Lord's army. How important is that? And, and the right answer as well. The, the, Joshua bowed right down and worshipped him as soon as he knew who he was. And he asked, the first question he asked, I want you to catch that there. What does my Lord say to his servant? Basically, he's saying, what do you want me to do? What's the battle you want me to be in? The right battle at the right time. See, and then another thing there too, when Jesus answers the question of, are you for us or for our adversaries? Jesus' answer was a resounding what? Come on, speak to me. What was the word? No. There you go. Good. Everyone say it one time. No. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So he said no. Why would you say no? I mean, wasn't the whole plan for them to cross the Jordan, get there, be circumcised, get everything set right, and then go in and take Jericho and take the land? Wasn't that the mission of God? Wasn't that what God laid out for them to do and why they were in the desert for those 38, 40 years waiting to get into the promised land, and now they're here, and it's like, whoa, wait a minute, what do you mean you're not for us? Here's what that no actually means. That, that no actually means no. But what he's saying is, I'm not for you. You need to be for me. There's, there's a big difference there between God being for you and you being for God, because you know what, just, just as important as it is for God to be for us I think it's more important that we're for him. Because here's, here's the thing. Think about this for a second. Who can change? Can God change? No, no, he can't. God is for us. That's his character. That's his DNA. He cannot change. His mission is the same since the beginning. Does our mission change? Does our mission waver? Do we change masters? Do we change leadership from time to time? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're the variable. We are the variable in that equation. So that's why when he answers no, it's more important that we are for him than he is for us. Because we know he doesn't change. When your battle is for selfish gain, it's not a battle for the Lord. It's, it's a battle for your own gain. 
See, there, there are a lot of causes you can take a stand for. There's a lot of causes you can take a stand for. Being a Christian doesn't mean that your cause that you have is a Christian cause. It doesn't mean it's the cause that Christ has for you. See, there are plenty of causes that people will say, I'm a Christian blank, or I'm a Christian this, or a Christian that. Does that mean that if their cause doesn't line up for Christ, but they're a Christian, that it's Christ's cause? Absolutely not. All right, it's probably time to speak some truth and get tagged as hate speech this morning, so... Thank you, YouTube. I'll say it now before it happens. So by saying I'm a Christian lesbian or a Christian gay, and I push the agenda of LGBT, are you in the battle for the Lord? Or are you in your own battle? You're in your own battle, my friend. It's a selfish battle. It's, it's a me battle. By the way, while I'm at it, this is the part where I get tagged for hate speech. There's, there's two genders, male, female. They fit together in harmony to reproduce after their kind to fill and rule this world. Yeah, it was an amen moment. Well, I'll get tagged for hate speech. How's that? <laughs> so anything designed or anything designed, that's kind of a bad word, anything that's outside of that design, out of that alignment, does it line up with the word of God? No. Absolutely not. It's a perversion. It's not a battle of the Lord. It's a selfish battle. It's a wrong battle. Now, am I not saying we should love the LGBT? Should, should we not love the people who are involved in that? Should we, should we, not, should we exclude, exclude them and shun them and not want them here in our church? Absolutely not. We want them here. We want to love on them, show them the love of Christ, and help them and encourage them to, to look at their sin and, and accept Christ. More importantly, accept Christ. Then we'll talk about your sin. So in, in this portion, though, we're told exactly who our battle is against. We, we know it's not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against each other. It's, it's spiritual behind the person. It's a spiritual battle. So who are our battle? Our, 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 who are we at war against? There's four. Four entities. The rulers of this present darkness. Now who are they? They're the demonic rulers that are out there. How about the authorities? Number two, the authorities of this present darkness. It's, it's Satan and his minions that, that stand in opposition to the authority of God. See, Paul, Paul was commissioned by God to take up the cause of leading people to the authority of God. See, as Christians, this is a cool one. You're called to do the same thing. Okay? We're called to lead people from the authority of darkness. So think about this for a second. We're secret agents. We get to sneak in, do, 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 into the, open the, you know, cut the fence and sneak in. And we get to walk in and we get to say, hey, you know what? Come with me. I have a new authority for a new general. This general's way better. You sneak them out of camp and out of the war zone or whatever, and you bring them back, and you get them in front of Christ, and you know what? They now have a new authority. They have a new authority in their life. That is what we are called to do. Think about that. What a mission. That's awesome. Number three, cosmic powers of this present darkness. A worldly prince of the unbelieving and ungodly. That's who we're leading people away from. See, now, now as we look at those, the first three have a direct impact on us here in this world. This fourth one, though, is, is outside of this world. It's not here in this world, which would be the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. But you know what? We're still contained within those heavenly places. The whole universe is still contained within those heavenly places. See, the, the heavenly places, this is where there's a constant battle taking place between good and evil. This is where the, the angels on both sides are battling. This is where that true battle is taking place. And this is the battle that takes place over our souls. And this is the same place that where when somebody gets saved, the angels stop battling for a couple seconds. They have a party, and then they go right back to battle. Isn't that awesome? So think about that. Every time you, you see someone get saved, accept Christ, or even yourself personally, when you accepted Christ, oh, baby, there was a party that took place that you'll never see the likes of again. 
until the next person gets saved. Now, each one of these four powers that are against you, they have a plan. Their plan is to overthrow the works of God. Their plan is to ultimately destroy what God has for you. What God has for you. Their plan is to lead you to destruction. And their plan is to lead you to destruction one of two ways. Either kicking and screaming if they have to, or they will lead you peacefully. They will lead you peacefully. How much of the world today is being led to the pit of hell peacefully because they don't know any better? A lot of the world. A ton of the world. I know it's a weight measurement, but... See, the church, this is what we're battling against. We're not battling against people. We're battling against the spiritual, against the d demonic, against the wills of the devil and, and his minions. So now that we have the right leader, we have the right battle. We move to, need to move into the last part. The very last part of this sermon this morning. <clears throat> Do you have the right equipment? Do you have the right equipment? Verse 13 reads again, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Second. All right. A couple of years ago, I was, I was working on a project at my house, and actually it wasn't my house, it was elsewhere, and I didn't have all my tools with me. I only had a select amount of tools with me. And I, I was looking at the project at hand, and I saw that there was something that, that needed to be done. And as I'm looking at it, I said, man, you know, I could really use a hammer right now. And I looked in my hand, and I had a ratchet. And I said, I know I have no hammer, but I have a ratchet. So guess what? That sucker became a hammer for a couple of seconds. And I'm going to reiterate a couple of seconds, because whack, whack, koosh, shattered apart. Looked in my hand and said, right project, right leader, wrong tool. Wrong tool in the hand. See, now when we use the wrong equipment, there's, there's a few things that can happen. The biggest one is failure. Failure is the biggest problem. See, I have somebody who tells me all the time, when you've got a hammer in your hand, every problem looks like it can be taken care of with a hammer. When you got a ratchet in your hand, not so much. Romans 13, 12. Romans 13, 12 reads, The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. See, there's, there's one thing that, that darkness can never do. Darkness can never, ever, ever stand up to light and say, I am going to control you. Darkness can never do that. Light is always going to win. It never loses, ever. I have a picture that I want to show. Pop that up. I love this picture. You've got the lit match, and you've got the shadow of the match, you've got the shadow of the hand, but the source of the light, is. does it cast a shadow? Absolutely not. Where's our light source? It's found in Christ. It's, it's found in God. It's the holiness. See, everything casts a shadow except the light. When we're in the presence of the Lord, there can be no darkness, there can be no um, unholiness, no shadows, and not a hint of anything. See, the Lord is that holy and righteous that, that darkness must run and flee. See, the armor that we're to take up, it's, it's the armor of God. It's the only armor. It's the only armor when you look at it from a biblical perspective. It's the only armor that can stand. And it can stand up against the attack of the enemy. Let's look at 1 Samuel for a second. We're not going to turn there this morning, but... 1 Samuel is, is another, another piece of armor that's, that's mentioned in 1 Samuel. 
And it's kind of an important story when we look at it. It's, it's the story of, of David. He's, he's a shepherd boy. And he's, he's been told by his dad to go out and, and look and, and see if his brothers are okay. And when he goes out to the, to the field where the battle's taking place between Israel and the, the uh, Philistines, and you got Goliath there, the filthy Goliath, and he's nine foot six and a huge burly dude, probably smells a little bit, can't fit in a standard shower, you know, so he's stinky. But he's a big dude, and he's hurling insults to the Jewish people. And David hears this. And he walks up and he says, why isn't anybody just killing this guy? Just go out with a spear and kill him. Hit him with a sword. You know, go out there with a, I don't know, stapler and just start beating on him. I don't care. Just go out there and beat the guy, right? He, he gets to the point where he says, I want this battle. I want this battle. And he knows it's supposed to be his battle from the Lord. He knows that because he's been training his whole life for it. He's, he's killed a lion. He's killed a bear. He's killed a bunch of stuff. He's pretty good with his sling. He knows this is his battle. He knows Saul is scared, and he was the king of the day, but Saul, in talking to him, says, yeah, fine, you know what? You want to go do it, go do it. He gives him his armor. Saul gives him his armor to David. Now remember, if you look at the stature of David versus Saul, Saul was a head above everybody else. He, he was a tall dude. Meanwhile, David was just, it says that he was a boy, but he becomes Saul's armor bearer. He's probably 19, 20 years old at this point. So he's, he's not just a little boy, he's basically a man at this point. He puts the armor on. He puts the armor on, he starts to move around, he tries to walk, and, and, and there's a struggle. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't happen as it should. That, that armor was made for somebody else, not for him. See, I remember one time Jaden, my, my daughter Jaden, when she was a little girl, I came home from ice fishing or something, I took my muck boots off, and I left them sitting by the door, and I go upstairs, and I hear her calling to me, Daddy, 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 come here, Daddy, Daddy, come here. Sorry, I didn't ask permission. I'll ask forgiveness later. <clears throat> I come down the stairs, and there she is in my muck boots. I kid you not, they were almost too tall for her. They just barely fit. They were up to, like, here on her. She's, Daddy, look. Daddy, look. As she's walking, her knee couldn't bend. There wasn't a flexibility there. It was a difficult walk. It was... It was it was funny to watch. It was cute. Somewhere I have a picture. I couldn't find it. I tried. <laughs> Very much so, because it would have been up there. It would have been up there. See, see, the armor needs to fit. The armor needs to fit. See, God, God through Paul gave us a pretty good list of the equipment that each one of us is going to need as we as we go through the series. See, it's, it's not the armor of Saul, though, that we're putting on. We cannot put on the armor of another. Say that again. We cannot put on the armor of another. Get your own. See, when, when you put, even if you tried to put on my armor, is my armor going to fit anybody in this room? No, not a single one of you, because you know what? Here's, here's why. My evil day is not the same as your evil day. My walk before the Lord is not your walk before the Lord. My calling is, before the Lord is not your calling before the Lord. My purpose is not necessarily the same purpose you have before the Lord. My armor is not going to fit any of you in this room. And likewise, none of your armor will fit anybody else in this room either. This is why it's so important that we go to God and we get our own armor. See, the only right armor you can have is your own. It, it, like I said, it can't be anybody else's. When you go to God and you tell him, hey, Lord, I want, I want your armor for me. You know what he's going to do? Custom build, custom make. It's going to be perfect for you. It's going to be standard issued. It's going to have your number on it, your name, who you are in his book of life. 
It's going to be your armor specifically tailored for you. If you're wondering this morning, is, is my armor up to God's standard? Easy way to find out, ask. Not me, ask him. He'll tell you. If your armor, you feel, hey, you know what, there's a weakness in the armor, say, hey, God, I, I need you to help me fix this weakness in the armor. Help me to build this up. Help me to make this area stronger and better. And then ask that your armor fits perfectly. Now, as we, as we close today, I want to remind us of the three things. It's important that we battle under the right leader. It's important that we have the right battle. And it's also important that we battle with the right equipment. See, all three of these are necessary to withstand the evil day as we stand firm in Jesus. Now, this, this morning, I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask that if anybody in this room feels that your armor might need, not be up to par, you, you feel, you know what, God, I, I, need to, I need to make sure I'm following you, you and you alone and you correctly. I need, I need to make sure that, that I'm in the right battles that you have for me. And, and thirdly, I, I need to make sure that I'm, I've got your armor on. I have the right equipment for the job. I want to ask you to come forward this morning so we can pray for you. I can have the elders come up as well. That'd be great. This way we can pray for you. I think it's important that, that we do spend time praying for each other that, because this is part of it as well. I mean, when you read down through that list, Paul ends with, with prayer. He, Paul ends with pray. And we need to be praying for one another. Heidi, if you'd like to come up and throw something on the keys, that would be fantastic. See, maybe, maybe this morning you've got a... Maybe this morning you're facing an evil day. You've got an evil day ahead of you. You know what's coming. Maybe you're in the middle of an evil day season, an evil day period of your life, and, and there's something that in you that's saying, I need to take a stand against that. <clears throat> today's the morning it's not afternoon yet it's still morning remember when we used to church used to go to afternoon see I'm asking you this morning that, that if, if that's you this morning I'm asking you to come running forward get prayer this morning see it's, it's more of an invitation to come to the altar See, this is, this is where we can stand in the gap for you and with you. Others as well in this room can stand in the gap for you and with you. We can pray against what's coming against you out of those four. Those four demonic powers, we will pray against them. See, this morning, one of the things we need to remember is, is where two or three are gathered, or two or three are gathered, who's in our presence? Jesus is in our presence. See, he's not going to leave you and forsake you. And Okay, you come up here and you get prayed for. and you, Maybe you feel nothing. Maybe you feel something. God's still hearing us. He's hearing our cry. He's hearing our call this morning. If that's you this morning, come forward. Come forward. See, coming forward is, is not an act of weakness. Coming forward for prayer for some people, you, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's this generation, if it's this season, this time that, that we're in, in this, in this region. But too often we look, at, we look at prayer and we look at our situation and we think, hey, you know, we're struggling with something. Well, it's, we, we look at coming up and receiving prayer from the elders of a church and we say, you know what, we're, I'm weak. I have a weakness in me. 
It's not a weakness to come and, and seek God and seek His face in, in a more intimate way. It's actually an act of surrender, not to me, not to the elders, not to anybody in this room. This is between you and God. This is a time where business can be done between you and God. Where there could be a setting free between you and God. Yes. Where you can move into where he needs you to be. Where he, he can speak to you and say, I am the right leader. I have the right purpose and mission and battle for you. And he can equip you in this moment to stand whatever is coming before you. See, every one of us has an evil day. The question is, is your armor ready for that evil day? Are you ready to stand in that evil day? You can go ahead and shut off the recording. We're just going to spend some time intimately worshiping God this morning. We're going to pray for those who came up. If It's not too late. If you... If you want to come up for prayer, you feel the need to come up for prayer, please come up for prayer.